Well, welcome to another program of Christ and Culture. My name is Pastor Jeff Short. This is Pastor Mel McGinnis, and we're talking about the ECT, Evangelicals and Catholics Together uh, movement in this 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Reformation started, well, it's, it's hard to say exactly when it started, but 1517 is the day, the time, the year when Martin Luther nailed his famous 95 Thesis to the Wittenberg door, and that launched a whole movement that eventually led to the division between Roman Catholics and Protestants, and 500 years later, there is still the divide between Protestantism and Catholicism, and we've just been covering in past episodes why there is still a division and why uh, unity is still not obtainable right now uh, because of the difference that the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant congregations hold to salvation, which is it by faith alone or is it just by faith with works, mm -hmm. with meritorious mm -hmm. works? And the last program, I made the comment that um, there is a possibility, the real possibility in our lifetime that we could see the Roman Catholic Church change on core doctrine, the formulation of Trent. And the reason I say that is because, in fact, today, the current Pope, is, for all intents and purposes, repudiating Orthodox Roman Catholic doctrine. And it's, in a kind of a clever way, he's trying to do it. The Roman Catholic teaching on marriage, very clearly, Pope after Pope after Pope reaffirmed this, Church has taught this, for century and century is that marriage is indissoluble. Indissolubility of marriage. Mm -hmm. And officially, the Roman Catholic Church does not even recognize divorce. And now you have, and, and consequently, a person who has been divorced and remarried in a civil union cannot take communion. That's been the way it's been for centuries and centuries in the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Francis wants to change that, mm. among other things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have a pope that is unwittingly opening up a fissure or a division within the church. And so we have to watch this and say, what's going to happen now? Because are you aware of the traditionalist and the Orthodox Roman Catholic people up in arms about Pope Francis? No, I didn't realize any that this feedback was about going, that? going on. I wasn't aware of what's been percolating in the Pope's mind about such important matters as that and how this will affect the church at large. Yes. Um, I don't know if you ever get an opportunity. Do you ever flip over to EWTN? No, I heard uh, That's Roman See Catholic. It, yeah. yeah. Eternal right. Word Television Network. Uh, Mother An Angelica yep. started it uh, back yeah. in the, I think, 70s, 80s, early 80s. Um, if you ever listen to Catholic Answers on the radio or, or internet, um, they, the whole big there is a crisis in the Roman Catholic Church right now, and that is centered on Pope Francis. Pope Francis is loved by most Roman Catholics because he is seemingly a loosening factor. He wants to loosen up the church. It's too stiff, it's too mm -hmm. orthodox, it's too literal, it's too rigid, you know, too many rules and everything. And as Protestants, we look back and we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. it is very canon law. I mean, mm -hmm. big, thick books of regulations and rules and defining every little last thing. Traditionalists see Pope Francis as, this guy's got to go. Yeah, 
I, would, under, I can understand that. There are four cardinals, high up, very high up cardinals, that sent Pope Francis a public letter and said, you need to explain yourself in your latest apostolic exhortation uh, where you say that or insinuate that it's legitimate for a divorced person to actually take communion. And so far the Pope has been silent. He hasn't answered anything like that. Mm. And these cardinals say, well, we're going to demand a answer or else we're going to take steps to possibly chastise a sitting Pope. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you ever heard of such a thing? There was yeah, a time no. in Roman Catholicism when you said anything, questioned the Pope, you were out of line. That's what yeah. Luther did, right? Yeah, right, right. And, and, and today it's a very different situation. So we may be seeing the, for a, a monumental change happen in Roman Catholicism. Uh, but, but in order to reconcile on the faith alone question, Trent would have to be modified. Significantly, yes. But my thing is, I haven't seen any indications from Pope Francis that he would want to go that direction. Not on this and, point, no. Yeah. No. And, and as I think about Pope Francis, um, there's a liberal stream there that would modify the church from its traditions and because there is that uh, threat of liberalism, mm -hmm. it focuses more on the moral and social than theological. Yes. So I wonder if in his mind he's questioning even the theological aspect of it, or he doesn't even go there. I, I don't Pope know. Francis is, is a real strange character because, you know, Roman Catholic popes are supposed to be people that uh, teach the faith and the doctrine and yeah. morals to the people. But Pope Francis seems to oftentimes be very naive theologically. Yeah. He doesn't seem to be all this sophisticated. He doesn't seem to get the subtleties of theology. Now Ratzinger was the total opposite. Right. Benedict XVI. I mean this guy was a professional theologian. Everything he said was carefully weighed and you could understand what he said. I mean, he taught yeah. Roman Catholic theology. Nothing strange coming from him. But Francis is somewhat of a loose cannon, and I'm telling you, he, if he lives five, ten years down the road, uh, there might be a crisis. There might even be a crisis before that where, where people actually go into uh, de facto schism, mm. where people say, he is not our pope, mm -hmm. or he is our pope, but he's in grave error. I mean, there are those sounds already taking place, so we'll see. But in order for there to be real unity around the gospel, uh, would you agree that there has to be some kind of movement by Rome in the direction of faith alone? Yes, right. Uh, <laughs> man, that would be an earthquake, theologically speaking, if they went back. To what they did at Trent, and I'm thinking that's about four centuries ago or more. Well, right around there. I'm not. I, I'm not sure on the dates. Yeah, it was of Trent. 15, uh, 1547 yeah. was when it either started or ended. Uh, so 30 years after Luther. Yeah. So you're talking about. Which is uh, strange. You know why? Years. Why hold a council 30 years after? It's all the all the all the the guns have been firing for 30 yeah. years, why, yeah. why, why try to correct something 30 years later? But yeah. um, uh. if you look at Trent, it wasn't really an attempt to sit down like some of these other councils of the past, like Council of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. You had theologians come in and, expl and try to understand the Christological mm -hmm. uh, differences between mm -hmm. Arius and Athanasius. Athanasius, yeah. And they actually dealt with the issue. Trent was not that. Yeah. They came in and said, okay, we got to find a way to put these heretics away. Right. 
So it's not like, oh, okay, you're really going to go into this in a theological way, or are you just going to come in politically and say, okay, we're going to throw these anathemas at you. Right. we got to correct these guys. There's no inquiry. There's no discussion. No. There's no debate. There's no. It's all done. Yep. Finished before it started, which is Calvin wrote about. Uh, said this is not the way you conduct a council on an issue. You already know what your conclusion is before it starts. Yeah, right. I say the mind's made up even before it begins. Well, one of the things, you know, we can go on into this ECT document. One of the things that comes out in this document is is this attitude among among the signers. It says, not all differences are authentic agree- disagreements, nor need all agreements divide. Differences and disagreements must be tested in discipline and sustained conversation. Um, the idea here is, you know, there are differences in Protestantism. Mm-hmm. Presbyterians, mm-hmm. Lutherans, Congregationalists, mm-hmm. Baptists, Methodists. You know, we don't all agree. Right. So we don't have to all agree, and, and they're applying it to Roman Catholics and evangelicals. Well, yeah, there are differences, but they don't all have to divide us. He's correct in that, right? Right. They don't all have to. Right. But there are some that are necessary to. Yeah. Now, I don't want to be like uh, these really anti-Catholic, mm-hmm. uh, hyper-fundamentalists. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. Talking about? Right. Yeah. I come across. It's like every doctrine where there's a difference is a fighting point. Um, yeah. Uh, could you see yourself joining in? I think I could, but I want to ask you, do you see yourself joining in if Rome could somehow understand the gospel yeah. in faith alone terms? Could you under, Could you say, well, that's a definitional thing and they're willing to do that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I could join with them. Yeah. And if I think they would uh, revoke Trent, the Council of Trent, they would have to do that. Uh, I, st- I mean, I still would have issues. Oh yeah, with oh yeah. We'd have all kinds of issues, but still, I mean, on, if they if they're together on the gospel, yeah, yeah, on that I I, key point, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and it seemed like if they were consistent, yeah, their theology of communion. Yeah. Meaning transubstantiation yeah. would also change. Yes, uh, we would hope that eventually that would come around. I could see, though, that, that that could be in the classification of false understanding yes. or error. Right. I would, I would, I would it wouldn't agree. be definitional right. of Christianity. Right. It, it definitely, it's like if you look at the Seventh Day Adventists, you know, like Ben Carson's mm-hmm. denomination. Have you ever studied that? Church? I haven't gone into depth, but I think Pretty there's some. Strange. Yeah, there's some investigative judgment. You ever heard yeah. of that? No. No. Oh boy. Yeah. Um, there was a fellow who came to one of the pastors' meetings in Jamestown here about 10 years ago when the pastors were getting together every week. I don't know if they do that anymore still. Yes, they do. Okay. Yeah. You remember the Seventh-day Adventist guy mm-hmm. who came in one time and started teaching? It was his time to give a little teaching from Scripture, young guy, and he started talking about the investigative judgment. And all he's trying to get everybody on board with this investigative judgment thing. And I'm thinking, why is he doing that? That is such a peculiar, mm. strange mm-hmm. oddity only in Seventh-day Adventists because of Ellen White, the woman that founded the denomination. I said, this is very strange. Um, but I, I can see, I can tolerate that. You know, the brother felt he needed to introduce us all to the investigative judgment doctrine of Seventh-day Adventism. Okay, fine. I still see him as a Christian. I still affirm him uh, because of his understanding of the gospel. But as far as that, nah, yeah, really bad. Okay. And there are other denominational quirk, quirky yeah. things that I, right. I, yeah, boy, yeah, I wouldn't want to go there. But um, so if ECT had been able to say, 
Um, and the Roman Catholic representatives were actually representing authentic Roman Catholicism. Of course, these signers can say anything you want. Oh, yeah, we accept the salvation by faith alone. That's not official, right? right. So it doesn't right. mean anything. Exactly. But if 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 Pope Francis went to Sweden and celebrated the anniversary of Martin Luther's 1517 <laughs> 95 thesis and said, "I do declare ex cathedra <laughs> from the chair yes. that we now." Embrace the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith alone. Right. Wow. <laughs> that would be an earthquake. <laughs> but, but then again, I wonder how much of an earth, how how great that earthquake would be felt amongst the church in general. In other words, would they realize? Would they really realize what statement is being made if Pope Francis ever did? He something would probably like get that. himself booted out of the Pope chair. Yeah. I don't think. I don't think Vatican would. Yeah. I mean, there have been popes removed and whatnot. Yeah. And I don't know Catholic government enough to know. Well, here's if the problem. He could um, do that. They, their understanding of, of continuing revelation is that you cannot change a doctrine that has been officially recognized as sacred mm. dogma. You can't go back and revisit and say, oh, that was wrong. You can't do it. You can't reform it that way. You cannot go back and correct a mistake if, because in the Roman Catholic view, there would be no mistake yeah. because the Holy Spirit guides the church, right. protects it from error. Right. It's an infallible church, supposedly. So you couldn't go back to Trent and say Trent was wrong. They would have to say Trent expressed itself yeah. in a confusing way <laughs> or whatever, however they do smooth that over, but that's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem. And so um, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for real reconciliation yeah. to happen. So I'm, I'm thinking, what do you think? Do you think this project is really, it's kind of a wishful thinking kind of a deal? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Um, Too bad. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is a dream of, I think it should be a dream of all Christians that the people who call themselves Christians would be united. Mm -hmm. Sure. Eastern Orthodox. Yep. Um, Roman Catholic and Protestant. Protestant. Yeah. I mean, it would be our dream, of course, that all of these groups would follow the way of, uh, what was the one, Herbert W. Armstrong's Church of... Worldwide Church of God. They... Yeah, they, for all intents and purposes, they came back they, into right. evangelical yeah. Christianity. I know it's, it's amazing. Who'd have, who'd have thunk it? I mean, I think Hank Hanegraaff had been in talks with the, the leadership after Herbert W. Armstrong died, mm -hmm. and convinced uh, one of the leading guys that they were in error on certain things, and they actually changed. Of course, that was a group that only had been around for. You know, 50, 60 years. Yeah. We're not talking about something that has been around for right. uh, centuries. Centuries, centuries, yeah. Centuries. yeah. So it, yeah. unfortunately, um, may be the case that um, we're not going to see uh, Rome and Protestantism ever come together on the gospel, yeah. which is basically coming together on the core value of Christianity. Right. Um, I mean, we may see one world government, we may see one world religion. Yeah. And that's attractive to people. Yes. But in the yes. midst of that, we've got to be a people who uh, keep our minds uh, on what Scripture has to say and be led by the Spirit in such a way so as to be able to discern truth from error. Right. And, you know, we're going to be talking more about Reformation issues in the weeks to come because, like I said, this is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Yeah. And I want to do everything I can to help people understand what the important issues were. Right. Um, we've talked about this before, but the gospel is number one, you know, authority. Mm -hmm. And we'll be talking about this at some other time, you know. Um, the Roman Catholic Church claims that, well, you're pointing to an authority that we as the church um, 
basically provided for you in the Bible. They, I don't know if you know this, the Roman Catholic Church claims that they put the Bible together. They officially recognized it and proclaimed it the Bible, and now we're pointing to something they put together. And it's like, no, no. that's not the way you understand right. it. That's not a right. proper understanding of how Scripture came here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they also claim that, well, there was a church for hundreds of years before there was a canon of Scripture, official canon of Scripture, and so it shows that Christ founded a church, not a book. Well, no, we're not claiming that Christ came to found a book, right. but his apostles and the, the first century uh, representatives of Christ recorded for us his words and his teachings, and now that is the authority. Mm -hmm. And not the church. Not the church, because the church can be distorted, it can be yep. twisted, it can be led into historical paths, and it boils right down to it. We'll get into this when we get into other the Reformation points, but it boils down, do you put your faith ultimately for the authority in the, quote, church, or do you put your faith in the Word of God? Right. And the Protestants would say, in the Word of God. In the Word of God, because we don't have anything else we can really trust. Are you yeah. telling me today, if I'm a Roman Catholic, I look to Pope Francis, I look to this man, I go, he's, he's the one that speaks for God today. Are you kidding no. me? I would hate to have right. to be in a position where I look to Pope Francis. Right. He's making all kinds of statements and, you know, going off the reservation here and mm -hmm. there and going off on his plane with a microphone and answering these questions. And then Rome has to do damage control yeah. every time I he know. speaks. Well, he didn't really mean that. He said that, but you have to understand it in this way. Um, crazy. Yeah. And that's the authority. Or are you telling me I have to look to these councils as infallible yeah. when a lot of times what they've said contradicted other councils that they said was infallible? Oh, I know. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to deal with some of these um, in the weeks to come. Um, so I will uh, refresh my understanding of Roman Catholic theology. I will also do some more reading in the Reformation, yeah. Calvin, Luther, see what they were saying, and hopefully in our discussions we can help people understand what these issues are, mm -hmm. because they really are important. Exactly. Yeah, and understanding these issues from a historical perspective will give people a clarity about their faith that they would otherwise not have. Yeah. And we need to be very clear thinking in our day and time with respect to not only morality, but theology. Yes. yes. And every single one of us is a theologian. Right. People say, I'm not a theologian. Yeah, I can understand what they're saying, but in reality, not a everybody is. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Not a doctorate in theology, not a master's in theology, but everybody, everybody. has ideas about God, and that's what theology is. That's what it about. is. So everybody's yeah. a theologian. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Well, we're going to have plenty to talk about in the weeks ahead. Um, some of the questions that I was thinking we could answer yeah. uh, in the weeks coming would be, uh, what essentially is the Reformation? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we've kind of talked about and, and hinted in and talk generally about what that is, but we'll get it, maybe we'll do a program on uh, what what actually is the Reformation, what essentially is it. Uh, I think people are confused about it. I mean, they know Martin Luther and all this, but they don't really know what it was. And then essentially what the second thing we could do a program on is uh, what essentially caused the Revol uh, Reformation. Yeah. Why did it have to take right. place? Right. And did it happen out of a vacuum? <laughs> yeah, what 
what led up were to Were there it. some precursors yes. that were involved here? Is there a history behind the outbreak of the Reformation? Right, and, and then what happened as a result of mm -hmm. the Reformation? Mm -hmm. Very um, significant. And, and, you know, things like, why does it matter today? Yeah. I mean, if we're Americans, people are listening as Americans, you really can't understand the Reform... You, can, you can't understand America without the Reformation. Right. And they don't know that connection. Yeah. They don't, they don't grasp the fact that the people that came over to this continent, this North America, Eastern Seaboard, were predominantly 99% Protestants, mm -hmm. uh, Reformation Protestants. Mm -hmm. So that determined a lot of the way the early America yeah. took shape. Yeah, yeah. And then, what, are there some other questions that you would uh, come to mind that we could deal with uh, on future programs? Yeah, it's like, well, why do the Catholics have priests and the Protestants don't? That came out of the Reformation. It came out of That's the Reformation. That's a result of the Reformation. That's a good question. Yeah. That would be a good good thing. And, uh, so we'll talk about all of those in a future episode. I appreciate you tuning in today. Stay with us. Hopefully we'll get to some of the questions that you have about the Reformation. And it will help us all understand our faith, our Christian faith, in a better light. Well, we're going to be signing off. This is Pastor Jeff Short. Pastor Mel McGinnis, and we'll catch you again on another episode of Christ and Culture. God bless.